We have one more story. Uh, before we go there, I want to say at the end of this, I would like to all the speakers to join me on the stage at the end of the talk because I have your speakers books and I would like to give them to all of you. Um, but now I would like to welcome back another face that we haven't seen in a little while, another Odd Salon fellow. Please welcome Daniel Cohen to come and tell us a story of a, one of the hoaxes that was sort of the reason that we wanted to do hoax as a theme, the story of the Piltdown Man. And he has a whole bunch of other sort of science uh, side notes that he would like to, to share about the Piltdown Man story. So welcome, Daniel. So I want to start by confessing that I thought I knew the Piltdown story well enough to very quickly summarize it to everybody. And following that, follow the career trajectory of one of the potential hoaxsters as he became an infamous philosopher who proposed the idea of the noosphere, which is where all of our collective thoughts live somewhere around the stratosphere, and talk about how that merged into a paranormal research lab at Princeton University that closed about eight years ago that studied and measured the noosphere before splitting into another group called the Global Consciousness Project that really studied the noosphere and then split into the Global Orgasm Project that was convinced that if you all orgasm simultaneously on the soul you will have world peace. Now, if, <laughs> because it resonates in the noosphere. It's the luminiferous ether. If anybody understood any of that, you should have your heads checked. But the, the fundamental assumption here was that, every, that I understood Piltdown enough to summarize it quickly. And it turns out that I didn't, which is embarrassing because I'm a biologist. And it's actually a dark story that deserves its own shot at being told. So that's what we're going to dive into now. You can ask me about the other stuff later. So please put yourselves back in a world where nationalism is on the rise, World War I is just around the corner, and this bad boy has just been ripped from the earth in Heidelberg, Germany. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's 1907, and that is the jawbone of Homo heidelbergensis, or Heidelberg man, which is considered to have been an organism that lived about 200,000 to 700,000 years ago and was the branch point between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. It's a big scientific discovery, but for our particular story, it's also a big social phenomenon. Because again, nationalism's on the rise and you can suddenly reach into the earth and pull your roots out. You can link your culture back to something that lived 200,000 years or more ago. And when you're trying to define national identity, that's a big deal. And who got this? The Germans. That's the backdrop against which our story unfolds. So I want to introduce you to the hoaxster now. We know who it is. His name was Charles Dawson. He was a lawyer, an amateur archaeologist, and we think we know how he did things. A lot of this is narrative, a lot of it is intelligent speculation, so bear that in mind with the rest of the story. But here we go. We know that he was seeking fortune and glory, as most of us do, and that he'd written about it extensively, lamenting how he'd never had the big find. We also think that he read the signs correctly and realized that Britain needed its paleoanthropological success. It had to one-up Germany. It was the right time. And so, as far as we understand, he took a very, very old human skull that happened to be very thick, and he took an orangutan skull, and he colored them using iron and chromic acid to produce that nice red-brown color on the surface of a fossil. He artfully shattered them, taking care to strategically crack certain things that would obscure easy identification later on. He filed the teeth down and used dental putty to reaffix them to make it look more like a human wear pattern and human dentition. And he scattered these along with other fossilized remains and flint tools in the Piltdown gravel beds. Now these notorious and nefarious deeds complete, the hoax begins in earnest. So he connects with a friend who is a curator at the National Museum, and he tells him the following story. Essentially, a gravel worker has been digging in Piltdown and has uncovered a large brown object that he naturally assumes is a coconut because when one is in England, this is the most obvious thing to exhume. <laughs> Who, and maybe it was a fossilized coconut, but that's... So, and what does one do when one finds a coconut in England? One smashes it. And apparently a fragment of this erstwhile coconut wound up in the hands of Dawson, who was convinced it was a human skull fragment, and he sends it on to his friend. And his friend, 
is Arthur Smith Woodward, the curator of the National Museum and prominent ichthyologist. Now, for those of you who don't know, an ichthyologist is a fish expert. But let's put that aside for the moment. Woodward correctly assumed that if this were real, this would be the breakthrough that Britain needed to put them on the paleoanthropology map. So he says, yes, we have to go after this. But don't tell anybody else till we have the, all the evidence ahead in front of us. And Dawson mysteriously says, okay, but I'm going to bring my assistant along. And his assistant is none other than Father Pierre Teilhard de Chardin who some of you may know, some of you may not know, he is the father of the noosphere theory, and he is who we were originally going to talk about, and he deserves his own talk, and he was very likely in on the hoax. But moving on, these three gentlemen move to Piltdown site and begin the excavation, and you see Woodward and Dawson here, busily digging. And over the next year, in, 20, in 1912, they uncover the following trove. These fragments of human skull up here, the mandible of the orangutan here with a detached incisor, and then assorted other real fossils and flint tools. Now from this, Woodward begins his reconstruction of what he thinks the skull of this organism actually looked like. And he arrives at the following conclusion, and I'm calling this the big-brained ape model. So what you can see is that it has the classic simian or ape elongated jaw, which butts out here, resulting in the sloped face which is characteristic of an ape. But it also has the large brain case of a human or a hominid. And this fit in with the hypotheses at the time that because what makes us human is our intelligence and what makes us intelligent is our brain size, therefore brains must have evolved first. And so people thought this made sense. And this was presented in 1912 and 1913 to the Geological Society. And they concluded that yes, this was a new species. This was in fact Aoanthropus dawsoni. Yeah, getting a fake species named after yourself is a big accomplishment. <laughs> and this was Dawson's Dawn Man. It was a big deal. The paper came out and it took the world by storm. It took the British scientific community by storm. There was a lot of excitement. But within months of it being published, the actual anatomists who study people took a look at this. And many of them, especially three prominent ones, all came to the same conclusion, and I've quoted just one of them here, that a single individual cannot be supposed to have carried this jaw and skull. Now, they didn't accuse anybody of any foul play. They honestly just thought that it was a case of bad taxidermy. <laughs> because that happened all the time. You find a couple creatures who die next to each other. You don't know who's who, and you stick them together in a funny way. It's classic in paleontology. And this, by the way, looks nothing like Harvey, right? Bad taxidermy. <laughs> but what they were basically saying was there's, there's no proof from the data you have that this skull belongs to this jaw and the whole argument hinges on the hinge. That was a bad pun. So <laughs> it's, called a, it's called the articular or occipital condyle and the condyles are circled in red there. That's where the jaw meets the skull. That's the pivot point, the muscle attachments move across that. It tells you a lot about the biomechanics of the jaw, how it was used, what the face looks like and that we think Dawson deliberately cracked to create this conundrum. And so what they said was, well, with the data you have, you can't really say that these two parts of the skeleton go together. In fact, what a shame, you're going to need to find another site, separate from the first, where you find the same association to convince anybody. Now Dawson says, hmm, and comes back very shortly after with a uh, molar and some skull fragments that he presents to Woodward. And when he's asked where the site is, he's very vague. He says, about three kilometers away from Piltdown 1. And Woodward's like, okay. He goes back to the Geological Society and he presents this molar and this skull fragment and says, boom, look, consistency. And the critics are like, well, okay, maybe we were wrong. They still have their doubts, but they can't say anything because nobody's really thinking this is forgery or nobody's willing to say it yet. And so very much rejoicing occurred after this. This is called the Piltdown Gang. It's a famous painting from 1915 depicting most of the major personalities involved in propagating and promoting Piltdown. And we see on the wall, they were so proud of this accomplishment that they included a portrait of Darwin. Yes, the irony should not escape anybody. And they took this and ran with it. You have New York Times headlines reading things like Piltdown Man was the first human. You have the head of the American Museum of Natural History at this time, who was Henry Osborne, stating the Dawn Man theory, saying that the aristocracy of man traces back to Piltdown, not to directly to an ape. This was a big deal. You could claim that this is the proto-human and he came from England. <laughs> now, at the same time, the dualists, the dualists were the people who said there were two different specimens involved in this hoax, right? The human skull and the ape jaw. They said, 
let's show this to the great granddaddy of paleoanatomists, who was Franz Weidenreich. And his conclusion was very much negative. Yes, indeed. He said, this is not a fossil. It should be erased. It's bullshit. He actually is the first to say that it was an orangutan jaw and a human skull. And he did this entirely from the cast of the specimen, because he didn't see the real specimen. He was a badass. And when someone like him says something like this, you should listen. But what was the response? <laughs> well, yes, the response very much was, oh, it's not bad taxidermy. It's real. And we were, you know, there's all sorts of stuff in the fossil record that doesn't make any sense. And they just kept on pushing this until everything fell apart. And we hit 1953. And this is the headline then. And it's all due to a new fellow named Kenneth Oakley, who joins the Natural History Museum in England and introduces a more transparent policy of access to specimens. Because previously, most of the anatomists have been looking at casts of Piltdown. So Oakley and his crew look at the actual bones. And Oakley is an expert at fluorine dating, where you look at the level of absorbed fluorine in fossils to tell something about the age range. And it turns out Woodward was also an expert at this, and he had used it previously to uncover another hoax, but he'd never chosen to use it on these specimens. But Oakley did it properly and found that first, the bones were too young. They'd been claiming that Aeoanthropus dawsoni was older than Homo heidelbergensis, right, to get one up on the Germans. But now it turned out it was significantly younger. Moreover, they weren't even internally consistent. The skull and the jaw didn't match in ages. He found file marks all over the teeth that had been noted earlier and just sort of ignored, indicating that someone had filed them down. He also came to the same conclusion again, bad taxidermy. And what happened after this was that the whole case for Piltdown collapsed. And it was a disaster. Many people's careers had been ruined by this. Piltdown had been used as an argument in the Scopes Monkey trial. Creationists still use Piltdown as a reason to doubt science today, even though science corrected itself. It had a lot of negative repercussions, and there was a lot of embarrassment. But the real question was, how did this happen? Because there was terrible fallout in the community, other than Darwin, who probably enjoyed it. But the <laughs> real question was, what? Right? Science? I don't know. How did this happen? This is the longest known running hoax in the history of science, 41 years. If it had hit 42, it would have been really special. But why? So Kenneth Oakley very tactfully says in the end of the paper that reveals the hoax, and he's the first to use the word hoax, he says that don't be so ashamed of yourselves for being taken in by this hoax because it was really well executed. And it was one of the most insidious and perfidious deeds in paleoanthropological history. But if you actually look at the hoax itself and the artifacts, you should be pretty damn ashamed of yourselves because there are file marks all over the teeth. The anatomist figured it out within months that it was a hoax. It isn't that it was such a technologically proficient hoax that allowed it to persist. It's what we've been seeing all night. It's that people wanted something else and they expected something else and that's exactly what they got. Now Stephen Jay Gould has written extensively or wrote extensively on Piltdown and he explains it as a very human problem that led to this. And he expresses it as a combination of hope, desire, and prejudice. So if we look at those in turn, we get the following. First, again, this was a time of very pronounced nationalism. And Woodward died before finding out that everything was a hoax, which is good or bad depending on how you look at it. But his posthumously published book was called The Earliest Englishman. That should give you a sense again of the national pride involved with this discovery. So people were dead set on seeing this as getting one up on the Germans, as proving their roots. There was a lot of emotion involved with this. Second, there was a fundamental lack of transparency. Again, most of the anatomists had to do their analyses with casts, not actually looking at the real fossils themselves. And they didn't look too closely anyway because a lot of people saw what they expected to see. And so this, again, is one of the places where we start to get some of the transparency that we're constantly advocating for in modern science and the access to specimens, data, et cetera. And lastly and most insidiously was that idea that what makes us human is our intelligence. What makes us intelligence is our large brain size. Therefore, brain should come first. Dawson gave them exactly what they expected to see, the big-brained ape. But shortly after that, all manner of specimens were uncovered that revealed the exact opposite trend and were internally consistent with each other, just not with Piltdown. For instance, Tongchild discovered in South Africa. And these all showed that the jaw developed first to account for changes in diet before we really acquired the larger brains. 
And it was actually not as dissonant as you would think that there were contradictory specimens because, and this is the insidious part of it, those contradictory specimens came from ethnic places like South Africa. And as we all know, in ethnic places, the cultures are less advanced. So if you were an English scientist, you could sort of write it off as saying, well, you know, English scientists or English history would show that we got the European side and the white Europeans had big brains first and it makes sense that we reached humanity ahead of these less developed cultures. And that was never explicitly written anywhere, but it's built into the zeitgeist of how these things were interpreted. And it's a mindset that's unfortunately still around today in various dark corners. And it's something we're constantly looking out for. But when you take these things together, you get the perfect storm for why Piltdown was so successful. And you can look at it as a tragedy, and it was, but at the end of the day, it's also an uplifting story in the sense that science is a self-correcting process, right? We may be a lot of curmudgeons and complain and shout and yell at each other all the time, but we never stop chewing on a problem. And we will find things out. It may take us a while, but we're constantly working on it. Nobody's perfect. And I think the thing to keep in mind from this is the very thing that I committed when I first proposed to do this talk and actually ignore the hoax itself. The stories we think we know are the ones we need to look at the most. So let's raise our glasses to those unexamined stories and to better taxidermy. <laughs>